the Dakar airlift continues. Personnel arriving in Sabah discover the weather conditions in Libya are somewhat worse than in Niger. Hello and welcome to Eurosports coverage. This is Ben Edwards and tonight we take a look back over the rally's origins. The early events which established the Dakar as one of the most demanding tests of man and machine in the world. The cars and bikes have changed over the years, but the challenge has remained much the same. The transfer of people and equipment has continued today. The three Antonov transport planes taking off at regular intervals and shipping cars, trucks, bikes and helicopters the 2,200 kilometres to Libya, where the rally will restart on Monday. A very different climate has greeted the first arrivals, from 40 degree heat in Niamey to 8 degrees and rain in Sabah in this more easterly part of the Sahara Desert. One of the organizers of the logistics saying we arrived yesterday in Libya to await the arrival of the first Antonov. Only 12 of us are involved in the logistics at this end. We've come to help unload the cars, the trucks, etc. And we've created a system with the help of the Libyan people. We've been really very, very cooperative. Well, they've been cooperative, but the weather's been a bit of a shock. Jackets, definitely the order of the day, with rain coming down and, as I mentioned, uh, temperatures very much lower than they've been experiencing on the way from Dakar. We've seen a lot of different terrain already on this rally as it's moved through Senegal into Mali, then Burkina Faso, and finally into Niger. Unfortunately, some of the most beautiful landscape of Africa will now be missed, the Teneri Desert with what some say are the most dramatic and beautiful dunes anywhere in the world. But Hubert Oriol assures, assures us that some of the pictures from Libya will be just as stunning. In spite of the loss of the Teneri Desert from the schedule, we've seen some great images already on this year's event. Let's just sit back and enjoy some of those pictures we've seen so far. competition on two wheels in this year's event has been the story of KTM versus BMW, much as it was last year when BMW took the laurels. This year, the advantage has so far swung in favour of the Austrian KTM team with Spanish rider Juan Roma. He's on the number seven machine. He's opened up a 22-minute advantage over Richard Sankt on the number one BMW. The tighter initial stages were perhaps more likely to favour the more nimble KTM, and while many of the factory riders had mechanical problems, Juan Roma has so far escaped them. Sank's hope of using the superior speed of the blue bike in the desert has now been reduced somewhat, although the stages in Libya should still suit him well. In the KTM camp, nothing is taken for granted. For KTM, it's better, obviously, for us in some ways, that the event has been stopped. Not so good for BMW. Because I have a lead and they could have taken time off me during the days that we should have competed in Niger. But we must be careful. Everything can happen in Libya, bad or good things for BMW or KTM. And Eric Bernard tells us, well, Roma is evidently happier than Richard is at the moment, but there are a lot of kilometers before we get to Cairo. Anything can happen. This stop has changed the rally competitively, but during this interruption, we have the time to sleep and repair the bikes. The danger of that is that at the end of the rally, Everybody will be extremely ready to go, it'll be very fast, so it'll be more dangerous. It could be a lot of surprises. And Jürgen Meyer tells us, the atmosphere in the KTM team is a little sad at the moment because of Kari Tiernan, who had to go home, and because of Alfie Cox, who's now a long way down due to changing his engine. Now we will concentrate our efforts to help Juan Roma, to help him win it, and also to help Heinz Kinnigardner, still in the event. And we'll do our best to see that KTM can win and be the first in Cairo at the pyramids. Then we'll have a big party. Well, that's certainly what uh, they're hoping for. What about the feelings in the BMW camp? 
KTM ont eu pas mal de soucis jusqu'à maintenant. Et, euh, KTM had a lot of trouble during the beginning of the rally. On va leur laisser un peu de temps de pouvoir travailler un peu plus sur le. Sur during le the early days, they had time to cure Et those problems, ça leur, ça leur to work a lot on their bikes and to be ready for the end of the rally. I think the, the rest of the rally, I think, will be a lot better. I, I think I've ridden the worst days for the bike, you know, as far as the tight technical stuff, and now it's time to let the thing go. So, eh, we'll just have to start a few days late. Sanks will have a battle on his hands to make up the 22-minute gap to Roma in the remaining six days of the competition. But bearing in mind the KTM team's woes this year, anything is indeed still possible. Coming up after the break, we'll be taking a look back at the very origins of the Dakar. So stay with us here on Eurosport. Como ellos, yo también me encargo de la seguridad. No la de las playas, sino la de su coche. En Euromaster somos especialistas en frenos, amortiguadores, neumáticos, en fin, en todo lo que concierne a su seguridad cuando usted conduce. Euromaster, 1300 centers in Europe. Estilete 50. <laughs> Suzuki. On British Eurosport every day. If you want to be on top of everything that's happening in the world of sport, turn on to British Sports Centre. With British presenters, up-to-the-minute bulletins throughout the day and special extended late-night editions every weekend. The heroes and the villains. This is the world picture with a British angle, right here on British Eurosport. British Sports Centre throughout the day and with three late night specials, Friday, Saturday and Sunday nights at 10. It's British Eurosport's brand new Paris Dakar Rally competition. And here's the question. When did the first Paris Dakar Rally take place? Was it 1969, 1979 or 1989? We've got more than 100 official Paris Dakar board games to be won. And there are portable video game stations for the runners-up. Call now to relive the Paris Dakar adventure at home on 0906 614 0028 and play and win with British Eurosport. Back to the Paris Dakar Caro Rally 2000 with Yako. The man who created the Dakar was Thierry Sabine, a man, according to Jackie X, who was a brilliant general. He was bold, prepared to take risks, and had a natural charisma that encouraged people to believe in him. In his own words, Sabine wanted to create a new adventure, one that would perhaps change the people that contested it. He thought it could be a school of life. That first event started on Boxing Day 1978 from the Trocadero in Paris. With 170 competitors, and the route took them down through Algeria, into Niger, Mali, Upper Volta, as Burkina Faso was known in those days, and into Senegal. There were no works entries, and both cars and bikes were lumped together in one class. Thierry Sabine took the role of race director, the man who created the whole thing was also the man briefing the riders and drivers at the start of each day. It was a whole new experience for both competitors and 
for the people whose countries the rally went through. And it turned out to be quite a success. The winner turned out to be a bike faster than all of the cars on this occasion. It was the Yamaha of Cyril Neveu, although the first car to reach the finish in Dakar was the Range Rover of Albert Genestier. 70 competitors made it to the finish and Cyril Neveu fell onto the platform. In 1980, the start took place on New Year's Day. The Marrow brothers were among the favourites and Martin de Cortins also competed on two wheels. Factory involvement began to play its part with three Volkswagen Iltis entered. One for Jean Ragnotti, another for Patrick Zanaroli, and one for former Formula 2 racer Freddy Kotilinski. Suspension setups were not quite so advanced in 1980. The Marrow brothers Claude and Bernard competed for the second time in their four-wheel drive Renault 4, and in spite of a lack of ground clearance, were extremely competitive. They would go on to finish in third place. But they couldn't quite match the Volkswagens, and it was indeed Freddy Kotilinski who came through for the victory, with Patrick Zanaroli taking second place, the Marrow brothers third. Cyril Neveu took his second win on his single-cylinder Yamaha, holding off the twin-cylinder BMWs of Oriol and Fenwi. Of the 216 starters, some 81 made it to the Pink Lake in Dakar. The entry increased to 291 the next year, but the dunes of the Teneri Desert were too much for some competitors. In the days before GPS, a map, a compass, and a look at the position of the sun were all that the competitors had to plot their course. Each rider had his own story of getting lost, having no idea where to go, even when riding with other riders in a group. Hubert Oriol, riding a BMW, took the lead after the sixth stage, chased by the Yamaha of Cherniovsky. Cyril Neveu, the winner of the previous year's event, was now riding a Honda, and Funwi was on another BMW. But it was Hubert Oriol who came through to take the victory on his BMW. 1981 was also the year that Jackie Ix first entered the event in a Citroen CX, but he lost time and then rolled the car towards the end. <laughs> Oriol then coming through to take his first victory on the Dakar. He would go on to win again on two wheels and later on on four wheels. In the cars, Rennie Match took the first of his three wins on the event in his Range Rover but less than 30% of the starters reached the finish on this occasion. <laughs> 1982 was the year that the Dakar became famous, famous in Britain because of the disappearance of Mark Thatcher and his co-driver Charlotte Verney, who went missing for three days only to turn up completely safe and sound. The rally saw a battle between the Marrow brothers in their new four-wheel drive turbocharged Renault 20. They were up against the Lada of Brievoine and the Mercedes of Jackie X and Claude Brasseur. X was competitive, but he ended up missing a checkpoint and the chance to win. And it was the Marrow brothers in their yellow and red Renault 20 who came through for the victory. A 
little staging for television on a few occasions. Didn't do anybody any harm. On the bike, Cyril Mavert took his third win in four attempts, this time on the Honda, while Georges Guan won the truck category. Coming up after the break, we'll continue our look back over the Dakar with the years 1983 to 1985.